good. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. We are building the beloved community. Come. Let us all worship together. Happy Sunday, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Welcome, come on, hi. It's good to be together again, whether you are joining us here in person or online through Zoom, or watching the recording later. It's good to be here with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. So we'd like to give this opportunity uh, what we call greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we'll project the image of everybody attending online. And we'll ask them to give us a good hearty wave. And then we'll ask everybody in the sanctuary Right back there, at that camera. Whenever and however we connect at BUC, we are building BUC. At home, on campus, in the world, every day. We are Birmingham Unitarian Church, and we are building the beloved community. We join other Unitarian Universalists around the world as we light our chalice. Join us now in our first hymn, number 95, More Love. There is more love 
So last week, we presented the idea of UU evangelism. This week, let's go a little further, and here's something, here's something we might not entirely agree with, and how to disagree, at least from my perspective, on what is sacred sin and salvation from an atheist point of view. But first, it is the mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. The plate share recipient for late July and August is Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. In 2018, Birmingham Unitarian Church passed a resolution affirming the need for changes in law and society to improve gun safety. Guns, gun violence is in opposition to our eight principles and is an issue that has implications for racial justice. There we go. Can we keep count of how many times I lose, lose position? for racial justice, social stability, and the democratic process. Fortunately, Michigan has passed common, son, common sense gun safety legislation that will establish several uni that will establish universal background checks for all firearm purchases, require locked storage, and allow reporting to keep firearms away from those at risk of harming themselves. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and, let, and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation, and we dedicate ourselves to its service. On the last Sunday of every month, oh, I'm sorry, before the last Sunday of every month, let's take a look at the joys and sorrows of the congregation for the week. We have had two shared from online. The first sorrow is from David Greer. His younger brother, Marlon, a retired professor from Murray State University of Kentucky, died two weeks ago from complications of chemotherapy. The second sorrow is from our Reverend Mandy Beal. Their home was significantly flooded on Thursday. They are all fine, but it will be a long restoration process. She says, it is a lot of chaos at a very inopportune time. I appreciate your grace and patience with slow responses from me. Also, big thanks to Derek for leading today's service solo and to Rabbi Alana Albert for organizing a meal train. And I'm gonna go ahead and say it, that big thanks I think was a tall joke. Uh, I did text with her briefly this morning and she said everything is still, it's going as good as it can be, but they have a plan and it sounds like things are moving forward. After the memorial candles, I'll be reading a short pastoral prayer for both the joys and sorrows and for memorializing those that we remember on the last Sunday of every month that may have passed. You are all welcome to light a candle for anyone that you are remembering this day or a concern in your heart. As you light your candle, you are invited to say the name of who you remember or your concern or simply stand in silence. Please remember to place your candle, lighted candle as far back in the candle holder as you can. The candle lit. From the chalice is for those who are being remembered by those joining us from Zoom.
Healing Strands of the Great Web by Erica Hewitt. Mystery of mysteries, we are thirsty for justice and bearing witness to grief. We are claiming our inherent wholeness and healing strands of the great web. We are hungry for liberation and cracking ourselves wide open. We are mourning for the dead and fighting for the living. We are singing joy for the striving. We are singing for joy and striving for meaning. We are embodying love, reaching out in love, acting on love's behalf, and letting that love wash over us, ebbing and flowing as it carries and holds us all. May we do it all over again as the new day comes. Now a moment of silence. First reading is titled Salvation by Dan Barker. Uh, it says here, if salvation is the cure, then atheism is the prevention. Below is an abstract of the speech by Dan, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Uh, the speech was given at the World Religions Conference Silver Jubilee in 2005 in Kitchener, Ontario. And uh, after reading this, I'd like to just share a couple of my own points about where sin and salvation does belong in the atheist mindset. <clears throat> Atheism is a philosophical position, a worldview that disbelieves or denies the existence of gods. It is not a religion. Atheism has no creeds, rituals, holy book, moral code, origin myth, sacred spaces, or shrines. It has no sin, divine judgment, forbidden words, prayer, worship, prophecy, group privileges, or anointed holy leaders. Atheists don't believe in a transcendent world or a supernatural afterlife. We atheists possess salvation. Oh. Got to number my pages. Most important, there is no orthodoxy in atheism. We atheists do not expect conformity of thought or action. To free thinkers, allowing for differences of opinion is a sign of health. Terry Mosier of the Montreal Gazette drew an editorial cartoon on March 5th, 2002, quoted, 
Here's a headline we'll never see. Agnostics slaughter atheists. Atheists are people simply, are simply people without theism. Uh, as a side note, I did look for the cartoon to give it full credit. It appears that it does not exist online anymore. Atheists are simply people without theism. However, many atheists have opinions about much of the above. We champion reason as the only tool of verifiable knowledge. For morality, most atheists, most atheists follow humanism, a set of natural perspectives, not rules, that help us think about how to live. In many religious traditions, salvation is a deliverance from one of the three deeds, danger, disease, and death. Most believers see these in both natural and supernatural ways. Danger can arise from an occupying conqueror or from a threat to morality and order by evil spirits, the devils. Disease and death can be both feared physically and spiritually. Atheists with the same human desire and fears also care about deliverance, but only as natural concerns. We see deliverance coming, if it is to come at all, in the real world from our own human efforts. Atheists with the same human desires and fears also care about deliverance. You didn't want to hear that another time, did you? Let's go to the next one. Sometimes no deliverance is needed at all. The New Testament, Jesus reportedly said, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick, Matthew 9, 12. We atheists consider ourselves whole. We are not sick. We don't need that doctor. Suppose you were convicted of a horrible crime and sentenced to life in prison. But after a few years behind bars, you were surprised to hear you were being released. This salvation would be a wonderful experience. But which would you make you feel better? Learning you were released because you were pardoned by the good graces of the governor? Or because you were found to be innocent of the crime? Which would give you more dignity? We atheists possess salvation not because we are released from a sentence, but because we don't deserve the punishment in the first place. We have committed no sin. Sin is a religious concept, and in some religions, salvation is the deliverance from the wages of sin, death, or eternal punishment. Sin has been defined as the missing mark of God's expectations or holiness, or offending God. So it follows that since there is no God, there is no sin, and therefore, no need for salvation. Only those who consider themselves sinners need this kind of salvation. It is a religious solution to a religious problem. We atheists might ask, how much respect should we give, or should we have for a doctor who cuts you with a knife just in order to sell you a bandage? If salvation is the cure, then atheism is the prevention. People who believe in sin and salvation have nothing to fear from us atheists. We are not barging into mosques, synagogues, and churches, dragging people from worship. If believers do not have freedom of conscience, then neither do we. Most humanists define ethics as the intention to act in ways that minimize harm Actions have consequences, so morality is a real-world exercise. A moral person is accountable. If my actions cause unnecessary harm, intentionally or unintentionally, then my salvation comes in trying to correct that harm or to repair that damage as much as possible. Canadian physician Dr. Marion Sherman, a prominent atheist from Victoria, BC, in the Toronto Star Weekly, a September 11, 1965 article, said, 
what makes an atheist tick? Saying, humanism sinks, seeks the fullest development of the human being. Humanists acknowledge no supreme being and we approach all life from the point of view of science and reason. Ours is not a coldly clinical view, for we believe that if human beings will but practice love of one another and use their wonderful faculty of speech, we can make a better world happy for all, but there must be no dogma. When asked about death, Dr. Sherman replied, it is the end of the organism. All we can hope is that we have found some sort of happiness in this life and that we have left the world a little better place. Those with a negative view of human nature might seek help in solving problems from outside humanity. But those with a positive view of human nature, a true hope, will work for salvation from within the human race using the tools of reason and kindness. For atheists, salvation is active problem solving. We do not think there is a purpose of life. If there were, that would cheapen life, making us tools or slaves of a master. We think there is purpose in life as long as there are problems to solve, hunger to feed, illness to cure, pain to lessen, inequality to eradicate, oppression to resist, knowledge to gain, and beauty to create, there will be meaning in life. If you want to be a kind... Oh, college student once asked Carl Sagan, what meaning is left if everything I've been taught since I was a child turns out to be untrue? Carl looked, him, looked at him and said, do something meaningful. If you want to be a good, kind person, then be a good, kind person. If salvation is the freedom from sin, then we atheists already have it. If salvation is deliverance from oppression and disease in the real world, then there, then there is real work to do. This is an ongoing effort. We atheists and humanists are happy to work shoulder to shoulder with the truly good religious people who also strive for a future with less violence and more understanding.
pretty well put together speech by Dan, right? He, uh, he came to atheism through reflection and reason uh, and being brought up as an evangelical preacher. He switched, I want to say, in his 30s or 40s, and you can hear that really reflected in his tone and his phrasing throughout that article. He tries to, uh, it appears to me at least, to lift the idea of being an atheist, being a humanist above the baggage of history, and to say just put all our faith in the future, right? Just keep working toward the future no matter how, no matter what, and just try and be good from here. But. From what I've seen, all those attempts to start over without acknowledging the interconnected roots that binds the world's pasts and to our future really start to ring hollow, right? To my tone deaf ear, there's, there's very little resonance there. There's no message. It rings suspiciously like orthodoxy. Just believe it, it'll happen. As the title of his foundation says, Freedom From Religion, he's kind of against all of it, right? He wants to free people from religion. But why would you want to take something away from someone that brings them joy, that brings them meaning, when it is a perspective difference, a very valid perspective difference? I think taking that uh, one second, I'm going off notes here. Yeah. No. <clears throat> but one of the things it does not bring is association, right? Forcing that kind of orthodoxy on people. Is creates those echo chambers. It creates those bubbles that people are constantly talking about. I would much prefer some sort of association that does more, that builds connections, and that when used wisely will help crispen, sharpen perspectives of the world that I may not have seen before. Those different perspectives, those valid perspectives, help root us in the shared world we all inhabit, right? We're all just uh, gruntled guests here on this world, trying to do the best we can. Just because I use one set of words to describe it, doesn't mean my words are any better than yours. His point of view disconnects the twisted etymology of the word sin. It has two roots. It is commingled in both Old Norse and Latin. Its current meaning has been adapted. Uh, the Old Norse was sin, spelled with a Y, and the concept was a moral or religious offense or misdeed. Right? Sounds to me like they covered both bases there, religious and moral. They got the sacred and the secular right next to each other. They acknowledged that it was there. But then the Latin meaning started to come in. And the Latin meaning, uh, my Latin is horrible, so I'm guessing it was pronounced something close to sin, but it's spelled S-O-N. Uh, so I'm guessing something along son or son, son. Do we have any, any Romans here? But that meaning was literally, that person there is guilty. So those two meanings have twisted to say that person is morally and religiously guilty. But 
by glossing over the deeds of the past and by trying to remove the idea of the original sin or the sins of the past, it's all a matter of perspective. You ask me what original sin was? It was the ignorance of the past. And we have to do better from where we are now to go forward. If you ask a Christian, if you ask a Muslim, if you ask a Hindu, they all have, you know, somewhere in there, the idea of be better for this reason, an external outside force pushing you. Personal opinion, anything that causes you to do good in the world, it's pretty good in my book. Nothing is static. Everything needs to be reassessed and looked at through the lens of today. What's uh, the perception being put forth in the reading is what's done is done. We can't undo it. Let's just do better. I would attempt to change that a little bit. That, that sounds a little bit like, oh my gosh, we can't do anything. But to me, looking at a point of salvation, a point of sin from a secular point of view, how does it apply to my world based on those meanings? That gives me the impetus to say, what's done is done. But what can be done to keep making it better? What can I do to make tomorrow simpler, better, different in someone's world? Everything needs to be reassessed. History guides us, every bit of it, whether viewed from a moral or righteous point of view. And should it be ever informing our future? You can go on about how entrenched wrongs, uh, I'm sorry, you can go on to keep addressing entrenched wrongs and embracing them and saying, yes, this is something that happened and I am ashamed, but let's go a little further. All it takes is the time to reach out to the right people, make sure you seem approachable, find the approachable ones, or just simply spread the word that you're looking to help. Don't let the world become one that we don't seek to rise above sin and salvation, no matter your definition of it, but one that we can dig in and do the work together. Now for our next hymn. Would you rise as you're willing and able, and we'll sing, Tis a Gift to be Simple. Uh, that's number 16 in your hymnal, and on the screen, of course.
Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship is ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be.